This story begins with a river that once nearly took the life of a small boy. One day, while young Amador played on the banks of the river, the strong currents gripped him and swept him away. Later, his frantic parents found him washed ashore and barely clinging to life. They prayed to the Virgin Carmen to spare Amador. The boy survived. Relieved and thankful, the parents solemnly promised the Virgin Carmen that young Amador would become a Zapateo dancer, which in the village of El Carmen signifies one of the highest forms of praise to the Holy Virgin. At the age of four, Amador learned Zapateo dance, and since then has performed in every annual procession of the Virgin through the village of El Carmen. In his late 60s, Amador still dances, though with less vigor and frequency due to the onslaught of diabetes. This is a compelling story of a promise fulfilled, what it means to be a dancer in the village of El Carmen, and the expression of faith through music. Amador continues to live with his family in the village of El Carmen, located along Peru's western coast, roughly 130 miles south of the capital city, Lima. El Carmen is one of Peru's main centers for black music and dance. A small village, El Carmen depends mostly upon farming. In the early 1990s, only a single generator powered the entire village. Today, most homes come equipped with electrical current, making the use of appliances and televisions commonplace. Amador and most of the inhabitants of El Carmen are descendants of slaves taken during the 16th century from West and South Africa. Slaves in Peru came from many diverse tribal groups. Instead of maintaining their distinct tribal identities, slaves quickly learned Spanish, adopted Catholicism, and integrated into the culture of their new country. Most of the slaves settled along the fertile coast of Peru, where they worked in the fishing trades and in cities as domestic servants, artisans, and manual laborers. Others lived and worked on large hacienda plantations. Now a tourist resort, San Jose Hacienda is a short walk from El Carmen. During the days of slavery, Amador's ancestors worked the fields of San Jose Hacienda, producing cotton, sugar, and grapes. 
Sometimes the Hacienda owners permitted them to perform music and dance in the Hacienda Square. Though today, the harsher realities of slavery remain clearly visible. In 1821, Peru gained independence from Spanish rule, though another 34 years passed before slavery finally ended. After slavery, former slaves continue to work on the plantations. Amador worked as chief of construction for the owners of the San Jose Hacienda until a land reformation movement began in the early 1970s. The government seized land from the Hacienda owners and redistributed it to descendants of former slaves. Consequently, Amador received four hectares of land that once belonged to the San Jose Hacienda. Today, Amador grows cotton on this land. The music that Amador teaches and performs today still bears the mark of slavery. Some references suggest that slave owners, fearing that traditional skin drums could be used to incite uprisings, banned their use. The Spanish Inquisition uh, uh, forbid this. They were against this because somehow they felt that the, the Africans had their own uh, way of evoking God probably or, or getting in touch with, with music as a way of calling the gods or expressing their feelings. So they said, no, we will not allow um, African descendants to have skin drums nor dance. Instead, black slaves pounded out rhythms on fish crates, boxes, and tabletops. Over time, makers produced and refined several box-like instruments, the most popular of which is the wooden cajon. In the 1970s, the cajon mostly circulated only in Peruvian cities. Guitarist Mickey Gonzalez describes how he first introduced the cajon to the village of El Carmen and to Amador. guitar zapateo style. So I was playing this kind of stuff. Cesar says, oh, you like this? I said, I love it, man. I'm, I want to learn. And he says, I know Amador. Amador is a super guy. You know, we'll go meet him. So we did. We had a big party. And at the time, like I said, he was not a violin player. He was a head dancer. So he was, we had some zapateadores, you know, dancers invited and other people who were singing stuff, old guys from El Guayao. We had this great party. And so we made a friendship, and then I started, you know, coming back. He, he gave us permission to come back, and I started, you know, visiting him and staying in his house. And uh, his sons were very young. There, there was no cajon in El Carmen. Actually, when I was there, nobody had a cajon. I was 26 when I got there, and me and a bunch of other guys that we played together, we kept going, and we were playing with a family. We gave a cajon to the Vallombrosio family and a guitar. And, you know, people could play. They got the cajon and they played naturally. <laughs> For some reason, they, they were very good. In recent times, the cajon has spread to other parts of the world, including Spain. Paco de Lucia, the uh, Spanish guitar player, he came to Lima and he had never heard about cajon music. And uh, I was there in a party when uh, Caetro Soto, who is a great cajon player, he used to play with Chabuca Granda, one of our main uh, composers, and uh, he gave Paco a cajon. Uh, Paco introduced cajon to flamenco, and most of uh, flamenco groups in Spain included this instrument into their music, and many people now talk about the flamenco cajon, thinking it's Spanish, but it's, it's Peruvian. By the end of the 19th century, Blacks had culturally mixed with other lower class races to the extent that their music no longer remained distinct. Instead, black music blended with Spanish and Andean traditions to form a fusion called criollo, 
which today remains the most popular genre of music in Peru. <laughs> However, black Peruvians perform criollo music using distinctly African traits, such as the use of coarse timbres and dance movements, which church leaders have often criticized for their sensuous and sexual nature. Black Peruvians also perform on the cajones using multiple rhythms. Amador's son Chebo demonstrates three of these rhythms, which would normally be played all at the same time on different cajones. Throughout Peru and other South American countries, Amador is known primarily as a master of Zapateo dance, which he teaches to his sons. Zapateo began in the 1800s as a Spanish dance, which soon gained interest among the lower classes, including blacks. During the slavery years, blacks embraced Christianity and the Catholic Church. Today, El Carmen is home to the Virgin Carmen, who once appeared there as an apparition. According to Catholic belief, the Virgin Carmen visits hell to gather the poorest and most lost souls who have been prayed over, and she delivers them to heaven. Twice a year, in December and July, the village honors the Virgin Carmen with a festival of music, prayer, and sermons, culminated by an all-night procession of the statue of the Virgin through the village streets. Keeping true to his parents' promise, Amador continues to perform in all of the festivals since boyhood. The day before the procession of the Virgin, Amador rehearses his sons, who will perform at the church later that evening. Due to his age, Amador dances very little, preferring to perform on the violin, which he learned from the legendary Jose Lorita. After Jose's death, Amador began playing the violin in earnest in order to keep the tradition alive. His style of playing bears influences of the Andean tradition of violin playing. Uh, Amador by Ambrosio, who plays violin uh, in a completely rhythm, uh, rhythmic way. And uh, I think his violin is just uh, another way of ac accompanying the drums. An important figurehead of black Peruvian music, Amador uses these rehearsals to disseminate his knowledge, skills, and the importance of playing the music well. The boys do not show enthusiasm. So Amador scolds them, using metaphors and imagery borrowed from the local dialect. <laughs> In the evening, musicians and dancers gather at Amador's house. Anticipation for the evening's performance grows.
Amador offers a short prayer for the children who will soon perform at the church. The performers move outside and leave for the church. At the church, a large crowd has already gathered. A group of boys perform the Panalivio, which dates back to the 1700s when black Peruvian slaves composed songs of lament, as did black slaves in America. The foot movements of the dancers represent the slaves marching and shuffling off to work all day under the brutal sun. The boys also mimic certain types of work that slaves performed in the fields. Panalivio was banned because the movements and the lyrics were offensive to the morals and were subversive. There's one line in the Panalivio, which is one of the dancers, mm -hmm. one of the dancers Amador does, he says, Yo me corte con la o, yo me corte con la o, ya me sale mucha sangre, ya me sale mucha sangre. I cut myself with a sickle and I'm bleeding a lot. No es la sangre que me sale, no es la sangre que me sale, solo que me mata el hambre, solo que me mata el hambre. It's not the blood, it's I'm very hungry, that's why I'm dying. It's <laughs> pretty surprising. This Zapateo dance is performed to greet the Virgin Carmen before she leaves for the procession and when she returns. Both Amador and his son Chebo perform on violin as fireworks punctuate the night's festivities. The festivities of the following day begin under a hot sun. As part of the afternoon mass, Amador sings a melody taken from an old Gregorian chant while two boys accompany with Zapateo dance. In the past, the church did not permit black music and dance during the mass because of its sensuous nature. Afterwards, Amador returns home and relaxes before he and his students perform a home concert for visiting tourists. These concerts help to supplement the household income. Amador's daughter Maribel operates a small dance school in order to teach the art of black Peruvian dance to young girls. Here, two of her students dance a festejo, while Amador observes from the side. Performed in a light-hearted and sensuous manner, the festejo dates back to the 1700s. Two young students perform a novelty dance called the Alcatraz, which slaves sometimes performed inside their quarters. Modern dance companies reintroduce the dance, though the dance's symbolic meanings remain obscure. Fire and the sexual movements of the dancers allude to ancient fertility rites, whereas another explanation suggests that the boy, wanting to see under the girl's dress, uses a candle to burn off the dress. To avoid the flame, the girl speeds up her dance. Two of Amador's sons demonstrate freestyle zapateo. 
While dancing Zapateo, young males flaunt their skills in the hope of winning the admiration of young females. Yo pienso que como los tambores que llegaron al Perú y otros instrumentos fueron prohibidos, que los patrones rítmicos de los tambores pueden haberse guardado en la memoria corporal y especialmente en el zapateo. Outside, preparations continue for the procession of Carmen through the streets. Some design flower arrangements to welcome the Virgin. After the home concert finishes, a young mother brings her sick son to Amador and asks him to pray over the child. Because Amador devotes his life to honoring the Virgin Carmen with Zapateo, many in the village believe that he has special powers. People can get cured. If you have faith, by dancing, you can cure somebody who is sick. This is very, it's a very deep uh, tradition of uh, faith. In the meantime, villagers gather in the streets to watch the procession, which has now begun. Instead of attending the procession, Amador receives a visit from a group of senoritos. These are upper-class whites who enjoy black Peruvian culture. Sometimes they invite themselves to parties where blacks perform. The senoritos mostly invent their own dance steps. Customarily, the musicians dishonestly praise the talents of the senoritos, for they bring the liquor. Outside, a local marching band plays a slow dirge as Carmen passes down the village streets. Carmen stops to recognize one of the homeowners who that evening gave gifts to Carmen. As sunrise approaches the next day, Carmen returns to the church. She performs a farewell dance with the help of the float bearers. Afterwards, they will tie Carmen down so that according to local beliefs, she does not run off to eat watermelons. Later in the day, villagers nurse hangovers and gather with friends. Outside the church, all appears quiet Inside, Carmen rests securely, not having run off in the darkness. Finally at home, Amador plays for family and friends who have gathered. Two weeks after taping, Amador suffered a severe stroke, which has left him bedridden. It is doubtful he will ever dance again.